Dawn here. This video is about kidney stones and my experience with kidney stones. In an effort to make a more interesting background for my videos and also to get out of the house, so I'm sort of multitasking here. I am driving around, my, ha my camera is hands-free, my baby's buckled in, everybody's safe. Uh, you may hear some squawking from time to time, but that's to be expected. <laughs> Um, whenever we get to a stop sign, she doesn't love that, but we're going to do what we can, okay? Don't worry, everyone's safe. Here we go. So I want to talk about my experience with kidney stones and why kidney stones are formed and also how you get rid of kidney stones. I want to just mention anyone who's watching this video, only 10% of the population will ever form kidney stones in the first place, no matter what your diet is. So you could have 10 people that are all eating exactly the same diet, you know, whatever causes kidney stones, and only one of them will get kidney stones. So for most of you watching this video, for most of my subscribers, this would never be an issue anyways, but it is good to know um, and to know kind of what the symptoms are and in case someone else you know has this. This is fantastic information. My first kidney stone, I was out with a friend and I had just started the Eat to Live diet only two or three months before actually, having vegan pizza and uh, I was about to leave and I started to get a feeling like I had a bladder infection. So I excused myself to go to the bathroom and I was like thinking about this pain I was having. Like this is really strange for us to suddenly come on like this. Anyways, I let it go and about 15, 20 minutes later, I suddenly got this fiery feeling in my back. Like my back was on fire. And I've never felt anything like that before and I don't think there's anything to compare it to. It's just the weirdest feeling, like it was just right? This one place was just on fire. And luckily my friend knew a, a person who had worked in a hospital or a nurse or something like that. So he called her right away and she said, because of my symptoms, I think she's having kidney stones. And I was like, oh great, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so we went to the ER and long story short, because the ER was really, this was in Tampa at the time and it was like midnight on a Saturday night and it was the worst time you could possibly have to try to go to the, um, the ER. So I, was in, I waited in the ER for like seven hours and everyone was going ahead of me and it was just the most excruciating seven hours of my life. I can't even imagine anyone else going through this. It was just terrible. And I'm sitting there trying to find ways to deal with it, pacing back and forth, you know, um, sitting, standing, kneeling, crouching, just doing everything I can to get out of this pain. And I, I didn't know what to do. It just, and it would come in waves. Like it would be really, really terrible for 20 minutes. And then it would go away for 20 minutes and it would come back. And I uh, would try to drink water and I would drink like a whole bottle of water and then that would feel a little bit better for a bit. And then it would come back and it was just, oh. Finally, it took me back into a room they admitted me and they did a, <laughs> I'll never forget this moment because they brought me into the room, set up the IV and gave me a Dilaudid, which is a very, very heavy painkiller. And it was the most incredibly transcend transcendent feeling I've ever had in my entire life to be in so much pain for well, about, probably about 10 hours at that point and then suddenly it's gone and I was like why couldn't you bring me back here six hours ago you know but anyways I was just happy to be out of pain and uh, they did a CT they did they ran all the tests blah 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 kidney stones and the fun thing that they do when people have kidney stones uh, depending on the size of the stone and if it's blocking the urine or not they'll just send you home and be like okay have fun <laughs> go past this. Um, so they sent me home with a strainer, which is like a piece of plastic you put over the toilet that will strain your urine. And I was supposed to use that until the stone came out so I could catch it. And then they could test it to find out what it was made of. Doesn't that sound like fun? But they sent me home with a really big prescription of painkillers. And so for the next week, I was on these heavy, heavy painkillers waiting for a stone to come out. I didn't know it was going to be like when it came out. And, and, um, for the next week or so, I didn't have a crazy ton of pain. I was kind of in and out of pain. And I was in bed the whole time on drugs, just really afraid of this feeling that would, you know, that the feeling would, sorry, come back. And so after a week, it kind of just went away, the pain. And I was like, okay, that was weird. 
I guess I must have passed passed it without knowing, but um, I had to just like move on with my life because it had been a week and I was like, I can't stay in bed forever and I wasn't in too much pain anymore, so I just let it go. This was in September of 2013. It was actually the week I met my husband, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Long story, unrelated. Anyhow, so this first stone apparently passed itself. I'm not really sure when or how, and I didn't have any proof of that either. Until about, uh, I think it was six months later, I got another stone. This one was a little bit more interesting because it came on as more of a dull pain in that same spot. So I knew it was kidney stone and I was like, oh crap, I got another stone. And this was only six months later. So I was like, holy crap, like that went really fast. Since, since the first stone had realized that drinking a lot of water was really important and that if I drink a full bottle of water in, you know, 15, 20 seconds, the pain would totally go away. So I called this the water cure, and I would use this cure for the next nine months. Every time the pain would come on, I would drink a whole bottle of water, the pain would go away in about 20 minutes. I mean, I would be in debilitating pain again, and you know, on the floor writhing, and I'd be like, I just need a bottle of water. So I'd get a bottle of water, I'd drink the whole thing. And I, I kept thinking to myself, this water cure <laughs> is not really a cure. Of course, I know my kidney stones are probably getting worse, and I have to find out a way to make them go away, um, you know, permanently, like get to the root of the problem. But I just, I didn't know how to do that. So I kept doing the water cure and I figured I might learn more about it when I got treated for the second kidney stone. <clears throat> Finally, after nine months, and this was really interesting because now it was actually around the time that I was um, planning my wedding to my now husband. And so he kind of was with me through this whole journey and it was just terrible, but he was a trooper and really helped me out. So finally, around the time that we're planning my wedding, I'm also thinking to myself, okay, I can't take this pain anymore. I have to get this kidney stone taken care of because it was getting really, really bad. You know, every 20, 30 minutes during the day, I would have to drink a full bottle of water and that's just not really like useful. So finally, I went and saw a urologist in Sarasota and they were great. They were very nice. They did, um, at this point, they just did an ultrasound because that's typically what they'll do when you've already been diagnosed with kidney stones because the first time they need to make sure that it's actually a kidney stone. And then, then they're like, oh, they can just use ultrasound to make sure that it's, again, a kidney stone. So they confirmed it was a kidney stone, but they confirmed that it was massive. It was, I think this one was like seven millimeters long, which is huge um, inside your kidney. And this is the type of stone that's too big for it to pass on its own. So they have to find another way to uh, get it out. Sometimes that can be surgery. Sometimes it can mean um, placing a stent in your ureter so that urine can flow, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes it can mean a procedure called lithotripsy, which is what I ended up getting, which was also very fun. Um, and I happened to get that lithotripsy uh, two days after my wedding. So that was a really fun um, honeymoon that we had. And lithotripsy is basically where they um, direct a sound, like a very loud sound at your kidneys, and the sound waves actually break up the stone. Incredible stuff, like super, super incredible. And I was like a little nervous about it, but they put you under and it's only supposed to feel like bruising or whatever. And the worst part about lithotripsy is that it's not invasive because it's just sound waves being blasted at your kidneys. But what it means is that those sound waves will break up the kidney stone into tiny little pieces. Now, hopefully, it breaks it up into particles like sand that just pass out with no problem. Or, in my case, it breaks it up into smaller yet huge kidney stones that you have to then pass. So for me, um, after this procedure, two days after my wedding, then I had to go on to pass five kidney stones in two weeks. And it was the darkest time of my life. I just remember um, my husband was an angel. I mean, absolute angel. We were in my bedroom for two weeks with the curtains drawn, pain meds, you know, and Flomax, which you're supposed to be on this pill, all these pills, so I was drinking all this water and passing these stones. And the only thing you can do is just wait. So we waited and we waited and I passed one and I passed the next one and days later I passed the next one and days later I passed the next one and it was just I can't even explain that kind of pain to be going
going through that for week, for two weeks straight. You know, I'd have um, half a day off and then the pain would begin again. And the longest time that it took me to pass one stone, I recall being 10 hours of just this wave, like, you know, just pain in the, in your, this one localized place. You can't even imagine how much it hurts. And I wouldn't even say it's the most painful feeling in the world. It's just that it's sustained. That was the longest one. There was a few other ones that were several hours long. At that point, I kind of OD'd on water, trying to make sure that I, um, here, I'm going to go to this area called Calico Basin, which is so beautiful. And I'll be able to show you some video of that. And I'm going to park because I have a few things I want to mention that are on a piece of paper that I can't read while I am driving here. Check this out, you guys. This is my backyard. Um, this is one of the things I love about Vegas is that not a lot of people know that this type of uh, landscape exists and you can camp and hike and do all these really, I shouldn't be saying this in front of all you people because now everyone knows. Anyways, it's one of my favorite places to be in the world so this is an appropriate place to do a video. Okay, so we pass all the kidney stones and then I'm like, you know what, I gotta get this under control. I have to figure out the cause of this and get to the root of it and stop it. So at this time, I had access to Dr. Furman's member center, which has a, it's a forum and it's incredible, you guys. Anytime I have a question about anything, it's pretty much always been answered, um, already been answered. So I went on there to look things up because I went, I had an appointment with my urologist and my urologist handed me a pamphlet that said, kidney stones we think are caused by lots of protein in the diet and you should get rid of all of these foods. And it had a list of like 40 foods that you weren't supposed to eat. And I swear you guys, it was like every food on the planet, especially every nutritarian food. And I was in the, I remember um, getting back to my car after this appointment because the doctor had told me that I still had two kidney stones in there, two little ones that were hanging out, sort of tucked in this area in my kidneys that couldn't get out. So I would have to pass those at some point too. And I didn't want to form any new kidney stones. So I was like, oh God, um, I need to change my diet. I need to, you know, try to fix this and make sure I don't have any more kidney stones. I go into the parking lot and I start crying because I'm like, I cannot believe all of the foods I have to give up. I never want to give all these up. It's so important to me to be a nutritarian. This is crazy. There must be some other solution. So I had to deal with that for a couple days until I finally was like, oh, let me check the member forum and see if this question has already been answered. See if Dr. Furman has any advice on this. So first of all, he says, about the cause and the formation of kidney stones and in this particular case he's talking about calcium oxalate kidney stones which is what I have the only way you would know that you have calcium oxalate stones is if you actually do catch the stone and they can test the makeup of it which I did with the second um, set of kidney stones and here actually let me show you a picture of those kidney stones after they were all passed um, I put this on my Instagram a long time ago so about the formation of kidney stones Dr. Furman says that Oxalates, which is uh, basically what kidney stones are formed of, precipitate out in the urine with an acid-forming diet and intake of animal protein. So other than avoiding high oxalate foods, you can't avoid all oxalates. And it's important and effective to keep the urine alkaline with a vegan diet and drink water between meals. And there's some other recommendations as well, which I'll um, give those in a sec. Well, I'm gonna have to drive because she gets really crabby if we're parked. If we're parked for too long, let's drive for a little bit. Um, Okay, we're moving. Jeez. Okay, so basically what he's saying there is that a vegan diet is really important to follow because it will reduce the amount of protein in the diet. And protein is one of the things that causes kidney stones. We know this now. So therefore, if you're eating a bunch of meat, you're eating a bunch of like animal products, cheese, dairy, things like this, these are the things that are going to um, precipitate that formation of kidney stones in your body and you don't want that of course because that's terrible and you also want to drink water now when I got done with my kidney stones I drank way too much water at first because I was trying to make sure I didn't get any more stones but I took it way too far so I was drinking like at one point when I first got out with the um, out of the lithotripsy I was drinking like oh my gosh you guys like well over a gallon I was drinking like about a gallon and a half to two gallons now for me that was way too much water and that's actually a dangerous thing to do is to drink too much water because there's a, ki a condition called I think it's called hyponatremia that is what happens when you drink too much water and you, you know the salts whoa we're having a little dust storm here hello Vegas it's really windy today and so 
I was interested to learn when I started looking into Furman's recommendations that actually drinking too much water is not good, but you want to have like kind of just enough to sort of thin out things as you eat and to thin out the urine and stuff like that. So what you're looking for is one glass of water, like eight, 10 ounces of water, nothing major after every meal and one glass of water before you go to bed. That's it. That's just four glasses of water, guys. Um, I was drinking like, oh my God, I mean, a bazillion glasses of water when I first got done and that was actually very harmful. I had this, um, the symptoms of hyponatremia are actually really scary and you feel really weird and I had that one day and I was like, oh, I, I better back off on the water thing. So I did. Then I finally got back to normal and everything was okay. Now the other recommendations are supplements. I don't know if you guys can see this, but look in the back. So before the little one gets really upset, I'm going to try to read the rest of this while parked here real quick. Let me just pull off the road. Oh, look, little quails. <laughs> this is a really nice area for nature things. Okay, so then there are foods that you should avoid. Now, of course, you should avoid very high protein foods, so any kind of meat, um, animal products, things like that. But there's also just a few nutritarian foods that you should avoid as well. And there's five greens, and those greens are just bear with her because she doesn't like to be sitting at one place for any for a long period of time. Here's the five greens you should avoid. Spinach, rhubarb, parsley, beet tops, and Swiss chard. And you should definitely not eat those raw. That's the worst way that you can take them in. Um, and But you can have all the other greens. So, Just drive slowly and we'll see if we can calm the monster in the back. <laughs> okay, so avoid those greens, don't eat too much protein, have some water throughout the day, and then the other and um, the other recommendations are to take probiotics as they help as they help to remove oxalates. Also a bit of magnesium, 250 to 300 twice a day, which I assume means milligrams, so I'm not sure what the the recommendation is on that, but 250 to 300 units per twice a day. And then also a little extra B6, like 25 milligrams a day to people who f form kidney stones because that inhibits calcium pooling in the kidney as well. So those are the recommendations from Dr. Furman that you should, um, it's kind of like the protocol. And then of course being 100% nutritarian is the other recommendation that's super important. So all of those things combined. Now, what is my experience with it? It works, you guys. Um, okay, now I can drive for the rest of the time to get her to try to be a little bit calm while I finish my little story here. Okay, so I, as soon as I read this, I had to mourn the death of Swiss chard and spinach in my diet a little bit and parsley. Um, I, I wasn't a big Swiss chard eater, but um, I wanted to get more into it, but I had to mourn the death of using those foods because I really like spinach. And so the big thing was that I had been using spinach in my smoothies every day for months. And that, I think, was one of the main reasons that helped these um, stones to form quicker than they might have otherwise. Uh-oh. We have a mutiny on our hands. The other thing to note is that I probably had been forming stones for a really long time with my animal protein diet before I went vegetarian, and then maybe it was the spinach that I was eating because um, I would grind it up in smoothies all the time, and I think that made it easier to digest and, and allowed me to eat a lot more spinach than you normally would, and so that is really what kind of helped those stones along a bit and what helped me form them so quickly within 6 to 12 months. And so large too, that 7 millimeter um, stone formed so quickly uh, after that other stone and I really think it had a lot to do with that spinach so after a period of mourning not being able to eat those vegetables because as we all know spinach is so easy to just throw in a smoothie because you can't even taste it um, I cut them all out and I swear to you I never had another stone it's uh, now okay that first stone I had was five years ago and I have not had a single one since that seven millimeter one which was three years ago so that to me, um, and I have been tested, I went to the urologist again, got, um, uh, it was like almost one year ago, I got some, uh, another ultrasound to make sure that I didn't have any more stones, and sure enough, no stones whatsoever in there. Now I had one or two stuck in there for about a year, 
but they must have just passed on their own and they didn't grow any bigger because last time I got tested there was nothing in there. So I am living proof, proof that that protocol works and I didn't even do the rest of the protocol. I didn't take probiotics, I didn't take magnesium. I did lower my protein intake because I was a nutritarian um, but, um, and I was drinking you know, a decent amount of water and um, no more stones. Okay, so just to reiterate though, only 10% of the population will ever form kidney stones no matter what you eat. So it's likely that you specifically don't have to worry about this, but you might know someone else that has symptoms or that could use this information as well, and this would be very helpful. Lisa. <laughs> She's like, mom, you talk too much. <laughs> okay, so that's all I got on kidney stones. Um, I know this is kind of a long video, so sorry if I talk too much, but uh, I needed to get all that out. If it did help you, if any of my videos help you, you can either subscribe to my YouTube channel, you can um, subscribe to my email newsletter, and if you subscribe to either of those, you'll get access to some um, giveaways that not anyone else will get access to. And also, the best way to, su um, to support me at this point, of course, is to support me on Patreon, which is the place where you can um, actually get some um, exclusive content that no one else sees. I don't post these videos or pictures or anything like that um, anywhere else. So check that out because I wanna keep doing this for you. This is my job, this is what I do, is try to support your getting healthy journey and I want us to be on this journey forever. So let's keep going and supporting each other. Thanks so much for watching. Comment down below what experience you have with kidney stones, if any, and we will have a discussion about this. And I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.